Hi there, it's Tim. Welcome back to The Corner, or if it's your first time, welcome. Today we're looking at the CBM 8050. This is the first of Commodore's high capacity dual disk drives for the PET series. And it's two disks. Each disk is half a gigabyte, 500K, single-sided on a regular uh, single-sided double density disk, the same as a 1541. So let's take a look. And the first thing that you notice about it is it is big. The drives themselves are full height and the case is made out of 18 gauge steel. So it's not only big, but it's blooming heavy as well. And if I just turn it around, you can see on the back is an IEEE 488 port. That's the parallel port that Commodore used in their early pet drives and power supply. And the main switch, this is down is on and up is off by the looks of it which is kind of the British way rather than the American way which we are normally used to. I have got here a IEEE cable just so that you can see what they look like and how they work. Now these would come in various lengths of this is a pretty much the shortest of about half a meter and they would go up to about five meters in length and they fit on the back that way around like that and the unique thing about these is that you can then stack them so like with a 1541 it has two serial ports and you can daisy chain devices by plugging them into the two serial ports this actually has a separate connector at the back of the first connector so you can in fact stack them like that And that gives you your multiple drives or your drive plus a printer or whatever else. And the other end is, goes to the PET. Now, Commodore being Commodore, they used a edge connector rather like, um, rather like the user port on a C64. In fact, exactly the same as a user port on a C64. The only difference is that the cutout slots were in a different position. So hopefully you couldn't plug the IEEE cable into the user port or the user port into the IEEE cable because that would be disastrous. And the reason that they did that, of course, was because these cables were quite expensive. But the irony is now the IEEE to PET cables are extremely rare and so consequently very, very expensive. And these are the cheap ones. So these drives came out in 1980 and they use exactly the same single-sided uh, double density disc that you get in a 1541 or that you use with a 1541 but they have more than three times the capacity of a 1541 disc so and these came out in 1980 1541 of course didn't come out until 1982 so yeah this is a 240 volt unit it says curry and morn or curry and morgan Calculator services. I wonder if that was the dealer or the owner. I presume that was the dealer. Now, if you've been following the channel for a while, you will know that in the background, one of the projects that I'm working on is this Raspberry Pi version of this very drive. Now, this week I've been designing the case for it and 3D printing it, and I've come across one little issue. So you can see we have screw holes and we have screw posts and they're supposed to go right the way through there. So thanks to our sponsor PCB Way, all I need to do is redesign the PCB with cutouts there and there, log on to pcbway.com, upload the Gerber files, tell them how many I want, and then in a week's time, this will come back with nice cutouts and we can put the new board in here and screw the case on and, and everything will fit perfectly. Also, PCB Way are celebrating their ninth anniversary and in their promotion, I managed to win some of these little OLED panels. So that's going to be coming as well. Thanks once again to www.pcbway.com. Go and check them out. Now to get into these, there are two screws. Basically at the sides 
of the drive. So I'm not going to just power this on. I don't know whether it works or not. I bought this completely untested. Big chunky screws. So I don't know if it works. And before I dare plug it in and power it on, I'm going to have a look inside. Now these are 18 gauge steel, just like a pet. And also just like a pet, they are hinged and open up. So what have we got? Apart from it being very dusty and dirty, we've got a big massive transformer. This is a um, 240 volt version. Two giant capacitors, drive mechanism, this is the analog board, and this is the digital board. Now the interesting thing about this digital board, apart from the fact that it is mounted on the roof, and so also mounted upside down, is, and that makes it very easy to access when it comes to servicing the drive, but you'll also see that it is very, very clean on the top. So I think, I think what you all want to see is what happens when we plug it in. So let's plug it in and turn it on. I'm not gonna connect it up to the computer. I'm just gonna see basically if the lights come on. Now we have three lights on the front, two green lights, and this is a bicolor red green LED, which, which acts as a power light and also an error light. So it goes red if there's an error and it flashes and it does all sorts of stuff. Let's plug it in and see what happens. Okay, I promise you I have not tried this beforehand. All I've done is plug the cable in, connected it to the mains and not even switched the mains on. So let's switch on the mains and let's switch the switch. Well, I suppose that was predictable. We have um, flashing lights, which means that there's an error. And we've got one, two, three, four, five. So we can go away and look that up and that will tell us what is actually wrong or what it thinks is wrong. And my guess it's going to be something in there. Now, I'm not sure if we're getting this, but just after I switch the cameras off, it let out a rather nasty noise and if you can see there is still a bit of smoke and I think it came out of the power supply. Or possibly and it smells. Is there a reefer capacitor in there and if so did it just die? It does pong a bit. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a shame I didn't catch it on camera when it actually went because I powered it off and switched the cameras off and still after it was powered down, that's what it did. So what's almost certainly happened is that the mains connector in here underneath this um, cover has got a filter capacitor in it and it's a reefer capacitor and that has gone which means that in theory we could still plug it in and it will work at least as much as it did before but we do need to change that out and I think looking at the state of the rest of this that it would be a good opportunity to just strip this down and clean it that does not turn very freely actually the more I'm doing that the more the better it turns but that does not turn very freely uh, that doesn't look too bad. But this uh, motor drive thing looks very mucky. Certainly it's going to need a clean before it's going to work properly. And I suspect underneath this drive, it's going to be very similar. Plus this board could do with a clean. So I think we're going to start dismantling it right now. We'll take the back panel off so that we can put a new connector on there and then we'll strip these out so that we can clean the inside of the case and I'll do that outside cleaning that is 
Okay, now remember how everything is plugged in. What I'm going to do is take a picture of the connectors just so that I know where they are connected. On the back there are just two screws that can go off. So this is riveted in, I'm going to need to drill that out. So that is actually held on to the transformer. I think I'm going to need to take that off. Okay, well that's keyed, so that's good. That can come off. To get the drives out, we need to unscrew them from the bottom. Two screws per each drive. I imagine that's going to cause them to fall down. Right, let's turn it back over. Okay, so I've unplugged that and I've unplugged that. And I've unplugged that from there. This I don't think needs to unplug because it's all part of this one unit. Although, it's going to come out from the front. Or perhaps it's not going to come out from the front. Perhaps there is something still holding it in. Ah yes, there's another screw. Somebody who actually knows what they're doing probably make a better job of this. That also needs to come off. And in fact the board needs to come off. Right, that's one drive. There we go. So now that will come out. That's the culprit. Now I'm going to take this downstairs and take it outside and clean it. Okay, now that's a lot cleaner. So I've also drilled out the rivets from this and you can see how the box has actually come away. So the reefer cap inside here, let go and force that open. Now this is wired up according to the American way and I had to go and look that up. Um, so white is actually neutral and black is live. So black is brown, white is blue in the normal European way of doing things. So I've got a regular socket, which I don't necessarily want to put another main, um, another filtered one on here. I could put another filtered one on here, but these are quite expensive and I don't really see the reason for it. So, I'm going to unsolder this and put this new one on and then we'll start putting it back together. Soldering iron, solder, heat shrink.
So I don't quite know how much we got and how much we didn't, but there is the new socket fitted and screwed in, or bolted in rather, with heat shrink and stuff. And all we need to do now is refit it. So it just slides back in there like that. The earth lead goes back onto the earth post. There we go. So now before I put the drives back in, while I've got them out, I'm going to do some more cleaning on them because I want to lubricate that and I want to lubricate these rails and clean the heads and so on. So this is the analog board. You can see it's actually scrubbed up quite nicely. So basically that's the electronics for that side, that's the electronics for that side. So I gave it a basic cleaning outside but what I really want to do now is give it a more thorough clean. This is the switch that determines whether there's a disc inside the machine because this tray will go down when the disc is in. There it is, that had just come out of the come out of the thing. I guess that switch is a little fragile. There it is, it's in. Okay, that will do, I think, for now, until we've tried it, and we'll do the other one. So this is the other drive, and you can see already it's rather freer, less dirty because it was underneath the circuit board. It's still got this board on top, so we're going to have to take this off. That's too big. Well, some parts of it are definitely much cleaner. Now, I've seen other videos where they've taken a leather punch and some new felt and made one of those. I don't have such things, but it might well be worth getting hold of. Spins quite nicely. That's not going back any time soon. Unfortunately, that's riveted shut. I'm going to need to get another micro switch. So, come back in a couple of days. In addition to the micro switch being broken, I've taken this off just to give it some more cleaning because it still wasn't very free. But we have a problem with the latch mechanism. I don't know if you can see this. This pushes down, when there's a disc in, and I'll simulate a disc by pushing this back. You push this down and it's supposed to latch. But it doesn't. I'll show you what I mean on this other one. Okay, it's already set. Right. So, the latch goes down, and it stays down, and then you push it down again, and it comes up. Down, up. And the way that works, if you underneath here, you may or may not be able to see it, it is in this. So, there's a little spindle sort of disc thing in there that rotates. I don't 
if you can see that. Oops. On this, push that in. It does not rotate. So, and this is this is the mechanism here. But to get at that, we need to take the front panel off. And then that comes out. So that's the thing that's supposed to rotate. I guess it needs a good clean. So I'm going to clean this up. Okay, now that's a lot better. It's actually rotating now. Not very well with my thumb, but then we can start putting it back together. There we go. Okay, so I just need to clean this. There we go. That's spinning nice and freely. So the next job is the micro switch. Now I've got a micro switch, it's not the same brand. And this lever is shorter, but I hope it's going to work. It seems to it's the right size. Okay, that's the old one off. There we go. Now we just have to set the position. Set. That's fine. There we go. Now we can start putting it back together again, again. Okay, the drives are in. Now let's put the board back.
goes to there. That goes to there. And this you have to figure out and see. Need to check the photographs just to see which way around that is. The, do, 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 the yellow one goes to that side. So that's plugged in, 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 these are plugged in. So, let's give it a try. There are still two screws in the back that I haven't put in, so let's put those in. So that is secure, that is off. Switch it on. Now we still get five flashes, which is what we had before, and we know what we think that is, so we can go and start looking at that one. Now you'll remember this VIC-20, which we put some ZIF sockets in so that we can test CPUs and 6522s. This is going to come in very handy right now because one of the two chips that could possibly have failed to give us the five flashing red lights error is one of the 6502s. And so I'll just switch this on. It will run through the tests. Now it's going to fail. That's not a problem because we're only after testing the CPU on this one. So I just don't have the um, diagnostic harness fully plugged in. But we know that it runs the test and so therefore the CPU must be good. And I can show you that by taking this one out and putting one of my stash in 6502A. In it goes. Power it up. and it's running the test, so that's a good CPU. Now, according to the diagnostics chart, flashing lights at startup errors, the problem is going to be zero page on the disk controller CPU, and that is this one, or it's going to be the 6530, which is this one, I believe. And this has the local RAM on it for this CPU, plus the ROM for this CPU is actually in here. Which means that if this is the problem, we need to have a daughter board made up to sit in there and extract the ROM out onto an EEPROM. We can do that because we have done that before. But let's start with the 6502 and let's get him out. There we go. Right. So, MPS6502, so we put him in here and run the test and this will either show the 6502 is the problem or it will show this is probably the problem. That is dead. So, 
we will put a big X on that and that will go in our dead parts bin okay pin one is at the bottom got our strap on okay moment of truth again Look at that, it's come up, it's working. So that was the problem, the 6502. This is now a fully initializing floppy drive. So we can go to the next stage of trying it out on the pet and seeing if we can actually make it go. Right, it's all plugged in, so let's give it a try. Switch on the drive, switch on the pet. So the lights flash, that's the reset coming from the PET. Let us do a DS dollar. 73 CBM DOS V 2.5-8050. That is correct. So we have communication between the drive and the PET. Now I don't know if these discs, they are supposedly new old stock. I don't know if they're any good. We will stick one in the drive and see what happens. So that's drive zero. Now these are not going to be formatted, so it's not going to give us a good result. That goes red, that's expected. 74 drive not ready, that is also expected. Okay, so let's format the disk. That's a good start. That's a good. It's done. Look at that. I think the flashing light there was because I didn't specify which drive it was in. So let's just try that again. D I R D zero. Yeah, that was quicker. So I'm going to take that out and try that in drive one. D I R D one. I know it's interesting. Didn't read it in drive one. Let's is that because it's got the same disk ID, I wonder. Let's put another disc in there and see if it will format. So header D1, I'm going to call it A250 disc. We don't need the I, so we can just call that 80. Are you sure? Well, it is talking to the drive. Okay, I've opened the lid up and you can see that the disc is spinning. So let's try another disc. I think if the drive itself was faulty, it would fail straight away because it's actually verifying what it writes. So it writes it, it reads it, and it verifies it. Just imagine how long a 8250 disc takes to format. There we go. Now I'm going to put the lid down. And stick this back on the top for the sake of ease of use and I'll see if we can get the drive 
and the screen on the camera at the same time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the first disc back into drive zero. The second disc is in drive one. So what we can do is we can just say directory and that will read both directories. And you see, if you ever wondered what the zero was on the front of the disc header, it's which drive it is. So you see you've got one, drive one, zero. Now if we type in a simple little program, So, simple little program. That's saved to drive zero. So, catalog is an alternate to directory and let's just C shift A. That will show our drive zero has got sub on it. And if we want to back it up to drive one, we can just say copy D zero to D one. If we can spell, of course. That does a little flashy flashy. And you can see we've got the program on both disks. So very easy disk copying. And it has a backup command as well, so you can do a backup from drive one to drive zero. That's a track-by-track track copy. So here is the working model 8050 Commodore dual disk drive. And that is actually getting reasonably warm. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you've got this far and watched to the end, thank you very much. Please like and subscribe and comment in the comment section below. And I will see you next time. Thanks very much. See ya.